In this lecture, we're going to define the notion of curvature along a smoothly parametrized curve R of t. Before we do that, I want to revisit the unit tangent vector t hat. So given some parametrization R of t, we compute the unit length tangent vector by first finding the regular tangent vector R prime of t and dividing it by its own length. Since this vector is unit length, if we have different parametrizations, they may have different velocity vectors. But after we take their velocity vectors and divide them by the speeds, they would all have the same unit tangent vectors, assuming that we're traveling in the same direction along the curve. So if you and your friend parametrize the same curve from point P to point Q two different ways, you may have different velocity vectors, but you would have the same unit tangent vectors. Why are we so interested in unit length tangent vectors? What do we use these for? And how I'd like to think about it is suppose I wanted to understand the shape of this curve that I've given you on the slide. How can I detect these bends back and forth? So in particular here, notice that we're bending pretty sharply. We have pretty sharp curvature. And here we're bending, but it's a little bit less. How can I measure that? How can I detect these zones of curvature? Now imagine drawing unit tangent vectors along this curve. So all of these vectors I'm drawing are ideally length one. Of course, I'm drawing it by hand, so who knows? Okay, so I've tried to sketch some unit tangent vectors along this curve. Recall that a vector is a length and a sense of direction. By using these normalized tangent vectors, which all have a consistent length, changes in t hat must correspond to changes in direction. So since we don't have to worry about the lengths of these vectors as I, as I study them from left to right, I know they all have the same length. Any change I pick up must correspond to a change in direction. So ultimately, t hat is going to give us a way to detect the curviness of a curve. This notion of the curviness of a curve that I'm trying to describe here actually has a name. It's curvature. So let's define that. Along some smoothly parametrized curve R of t, the curvature, which we use this Greek letter kappa for, is defined to be the magnitude of the rate of change of t hat with respect to, not time, arc length. To see why this definition makes sense, let's look at what this definition would measure. Suppose I have three concentric circles. So these are three parametric curves, let's say. So the smallest one is some parametric curve, and then we have a middle one and an outer one. Let me imagine that I take a consistent unit of arc length. So let this length be the same arc length that I'm going to sketch on all three curves. On my inside curve, let's say that's about like this. On my middle curve, that unit of arc length is going to be like this. And then on my outermost curve, it's like this. So how does t hat change as we travel the same amount of arc length on these three curves? So if I draw some examples of, of unit tangent vectors going around these curves, you can see that for the same distance traveled to so the same arc length on all three curves, the middle tangent vector changed the most. We went almost one full revolution around. So you can see this vector started vertical and then it turned on its side and then it pointed down. So this one experienced the most change. The middle one experienced less change, but more change than the outermost curve. 
So if our notion of curvature is the magnitude of the rate of change of t hat, that tells us that the inner one is the curviest. So that innermost circle has the largest curvature value. And the outermost one has the smallest of these three circles. So this is the smallest curvature for that outer circle. That's why we define curvature as a rate of change of t hat with respect to arc length so that we're looking at some property which is intrinsic to these curves, doesn't depend on the parametrization. So we want to say, can we compare the curviness of two curves across the same distance traveled? In practice, we have two other ways of computing the curvature, which do not depend on using the arc length parameter. Let me drive the first method. So we said that kappa at t was the magnitude of the rate of change of t hat with respect to s. Using the chain rule, I can write that as the rate of change of t hat with respect to t, where that's the parameter for our parametrization, times dt ds. The first derivative I'm just going to write as t hat prime of t. And then since the speed is never zero on a smoothly parametrized curve, dt ds is actually 1 over ds dt, or 1 over s prime of t. And s prime is the speed. So what this derivation is getting at is that we can compute the curvature as the magnitude of t prime, t hat prime, divided by the magnitude of r prime. So that's the formula I just derived. If your curve is parametrized as r of t, then you can compute t hat, take its derivative with respect to t and compute the length, that gives you the numerator, and then divide that by the speed of the curve. Some students also like this formula. So this is another formula for curvature that I'm not going to derive. I think people like it because they don't have to worry about t hat at all. So if you compute the velocity vector and you compute the acceleration vector, then you can plug into this formula. Before we look at some examples, I want to finish with a remark here, which is that t hat is a unit vector. So sometimes students see this numerator and they think it must be 1. But that's not the case. Although t hat is a unit length vector, its derivative is not necessarily unit length. In fact, it could really could be anything. And the reason why goes back to the notion that a vector has both a magnitude and a sense of direction. So while t hat has a consistent magnitude, its direction can change, and this derivative is going to detect that. Okay, let's look at an example. Let's compute the curvature function for the parametric curve given by r of t equals a cosine t, a sine t, 5, for t going from 0 to 2 pi with some positive number a. So the idea here is that this is a circle of radius a in the plane z equals 5, but I didn't want to use the letter r because I'm already using that for the curve. So I'm just calling that capital A. So that's like the radius of the circle whose, whose curvature we're about to compute. I'm going to use the first formula that I just mentioned. So we will find t hat, t hat prime, and the speed to set up curvature this way. These computations may involve multiple steps. And sometimes when students see these problems, they're like, oh, I really don't want to do this right now. The first step is always to compute the velocity vector. Don't spend too much time agonizing over how many steps you have to do. Just go ahead and compute r prime. So r prime of t is going to be negative a sine t, a cosine t, 0. OK, now let's compute the speed. That's going to be the square root of a squared sine squared plus a squared cosine squared plus 0. So overall, that's a. OK, we've got the velocity vector. We've got the speed. To get t hat, I need to take the first and divide it by the second. This computation wasn't too bad, so we just divide r prime by a, and we're left with the unit vector negative sine t cosine t 0. That is a unit length vector, as we would expect, because it's t hat. Now to get the numerator that we need, we need to differentiate this vector with respect to t and then compute its length. So let's compute t hat prime. That's going to be negative cosine of t, negative sine of t, 0. 
We compute that length, and actually that's a unit length factor. So we can say that the curvature function along this curve is one divided by a. In fact, it's one over the radius of this circle. And that is true for any circle. So if you take a circle, the curvature of that circle is one over the radius. Let me go back to my concentric circles example. We have three radii here. Let me call them A1, A2, A3. A1 is the smallest radius. So when I invert it and I do one over A1, that's the biggest curvature. For the outermost circle, it has the largest radius. So when I invert it and I do one over that radius, I get the smallest curvature. Okay, let's look at another example. Here we have a helix. So let r of t be sine of pi t, two pi t, cosine pi t from zero to 20. Let's find t hat. We'll do it specifically at the point zero, zero, one, and then we'll compute the curvature at that point. Again, the first thing to do is always to take the derivative. So let's just go ahead and get the velocity vector. Next, let's get the speed. So what is the length of this velocity vector? After simplification, we find that the speed is pi times the square root of five. I could actually write down t hat in general. So that would be cosine pi t over the square root of five, two over the square root of five, negative sine pi t over the square root of five. I could actually keep going and compute the curvature in general, but let me go ahead and, and focus on the point P that we were given. So I was given the point zero, zero, 001. I wasn't given a parameter value, but notice that that point must be R of zero. So if I plug in zero, we're gonna get that the unit tangent vector at that point is one over the square root of five, two over the square root of five, zero. But if I want to keep going and compute the curvature, I still have to take a derivative. So to compute the derivative of the unit length tangent vector, I can't differentiate this because this is now just a constant vector. It's no longer a function of t. I must differentiate the unit tangent vector as a function of t. So let me go back to this line and compute that derivative to get t hat prime. So as you're working through these problems, it might be tempted to go ahead and plug in a certain value for time, but you might do it too early. So you have to work with the general expressions any time that you need to take a derivative. Okay, so what is t hat prime? It looks like this. So negative pi sine pi t over the square root of five, zero, negative pi cosine pi t over the square root of five. Now I can plug in zero once again to get t hat prime at the moment that we're interested in. So at the moment we're interested in, t hat prime at zero is zero, zero, negative pi over the square root of five. Now we can compute the curvature at that moment. So that's the length of the vector we just found. That length is pi over the square root of five, divided by the speed, which is pi times the square root of five. So overall we get a curvature of one fifth. That's actually the curvature for the entire helix. So it's not just the curvature at t equals zero, it's actually the curvature for all t. I wanna stick with the same helix and solve the same problem that we just did, but this time what I'm going to do is actually reparametrize this curve with respect to arc length. This is optional, I just wanna show you what happens when you do this. Before we found that the speed was pi times the square root of five, so my arc length function is going to be the integral from zero to t pi square root of five du. So we anti-differentiate and get pi square root of five t. That's step one of the reparametrization with respect to arc length. Now step two is to invert and write that t is s divided by pi square root of five. Now we plug that in to get our reparametrization. This is our reparametrization with respect to arc length, which means that when I compute the velocity vector for this reparametrization, it actually gives me t hat automatically.
and it's going to be t hat with respect to s. So I'll write t hat of s is the velocity vector for this reparametrization. This is t hat of s. So if you think back to the way that we actually defined curvature, if I can compute the derivative of t hat with respect to s, so I just differentiate the vector we found and compute its magnitude, that's going to give us the curvature right away. So our curvature is the length of the vector I just computed, which is 1 fifth. So while it's not always possible or practical to reparametrize a curve with respect to arc length, if you do it, it can actually simplify this calculation. Okay, let's finish today by talking about the geometric meaning of, of the curvature. We're going to relate the curvature at a point along this curve to the oscillating circle. I like to think of the oscillating circle as the best fitting tangent circle to the curve at a given point. So in particular, suppose I have this point here, let's call this point P, and this point here, let's call this Q. Let me sketch what the oscillating circle would look like at these two points. So this is what I mean by best fitting tangent circle. That's what the oscillating circle would look like at these two points. Now let's say the radius for the oscillating circle at point P is A1. Whereas the radius for the oscillating circle at Q is A2. The relationship between the curvature and these oscillating circles is that if you were to compute the curvature at point P, it would be one over A1. And since that's a smaller radius, that's going to be a larger number than the curvature at point Q, which is one over A2. I just wanted to throw this idea up here just to give you this relationship between curvature and the radii of circles and the best fitting tangent circle to a curve. I'm going to stop here, but we'll return to the oscillating circle later. Thank you for your attention.